Good morning, everyone. Um, after that first act, I feel a little stiff. Um, I, I was watching them warm up back there, and I'm saying they're warming up, and I'm just drinking coffee. There's something wrong here, right? Um, I'm, so I'm a chief storyteller at IBM, and I know that we've got people here from, from companies that are very, built, very much built around story, things like Pixar and Disney and, and Cirque and so forth. But at, at IBM, it's a little bit differently as, as some of the companies that you maybe represent. And so as a chief storyteller, um, it's not so common. What I'd like to do, and I ask, ask this at a lot of the conferences I go to, but if you are in the audience and in your title, like on your business card or on your plaque or whatever, you have the word storyteller. I am a you know, professional storyteller. Would you just raise your hand for me for a moment? Anyone? How many? Okay, not that many hands. You guys need to come out of, you know, and become aware. Let people know that you're a storyteller, first of all. So, um, but storytelling is one of those things that hasn't caught on a whole lot as far as in corporations. In fact, I was at, with my wife at a uh, financial institution last, just last week, and they were filling out some information, and the guy was sitting at his computer, you know, typing and stuff. And he said, you know, employer, I said, IBM. He said, occupation, I said, storyteller, and he just stopped typing. And he's looking at the screen, and he kind of looks over at me, and he says, I can put that in if you want. And I was like, yeah, dude, that's, that is actually my business card. So my business card actually, if I can see that, is storyteller, okay? And these are collectibles, by the way, in most corporations because they're like, I want to know that, you know, that, that title. I'd like to use that. The, the thing that most of us understand, though, is that storyteller may be an occupation, but it's also something that we are. We're just storytellers. And we are, we, everyone is a storyteller, but some of us have chosen to focus on it. Uh, some of us have come by it in certain ways. Um, this actually is a, a picture of myself when I was younger. Um, and yes, that is a live skunk on the table. I grew up in Savannah, Georgia. I have a picture just like this with a playpen, and there's a live raccoon in the, in the cage with me. In the cage with me. You know, I don't know who's in the cage, the raccoon or I. But when you grow up in this kind of circumstance, and I think when you grow up with groups of people that are creative, and I don't know if it's something southern or whatever, but we tend to use story a lot. But I worked at 12 companies before coming to IBM of all different sizes, and I have discovered that corporations sometimes don't necessarily uh, you know, embrace story. Sometimes they also want you almost to check it at the door. You know, that's, that's that, and this is business, and it's something that we do differently. In fact, I was with a group of people down in uh, Bogota, Colombia. I was meeting with a, a group of executives. We were talking about the future of work and the need for creativity, and I stayed at a place called the 101 Park House. And this was actually the door hanger that was on the door. And I loved it because the English says, shh, I'm being creative right now. Please do not disturb. And I found the, the, the manager of the hotel, and I said, can I steal one of these? And I took that to the conference that afternoon. And I held this up to people. And I said, okay, so you executives, you people in the room, if you have people in your organization and you walked up to their cubicle or to their office and they had this hanging outside, said, shh, leave me alone right now. I'm being creative. What would be your response? And I did that not only that day, but many days since then across the world. And I can tell you, in most audiences, I've had people who have been bold enough or at least honest enough to say, my first reaction is, get back to work. Okay? And that's unfortunate. Okay? Because, in fact, some of you are here because, you know, someone sent you. A company allowed you to come and you kind of had to justify why you come. In fact, when you go back, there's a good chance that someone's going to ask you, so what did you do? And if you're in business mode, now you as storytellers may not be so much, but if you're in business mode, you'll start saying things like, well, I went to this session, I did this thing, we talked about this, I learned this, this is a story spine, whatever. And you start, it's almost like report, report, report. But if you, that's, if you had the same question asked of you by a loved one or by someone that you're, you know, that you're out drinking with or whatever, and they say, so you were in Nashville last week with this cur carnival of curiosity, what was that all about? you will start telling stories. We all naturally tell stories and about people and experiences. And you'll use words like, you know, they moved me, or this, this person, their, their, their poem touched me, or this person inspired me. Those words you don't normally hear in a corporate setting. But it's really required because our brains, as we know, have two parts, the left and the right brain. There's the part that, you know, that kind of has the logical part, and then there's this other part, this wild-eyed part that most of us represent, this other side. And corporations are really in a need of, of exposing that now. In fact, to do, what I want to do is I'm just going to use some quotes from some people that I respect highly and some people that are, that are authorities. I don't consider myself an authority by much, but I, I know authorities. Um, Seth Godin said, we're no longer in the, you know, people are no longer buying goods and services. They're buying relations and stories and magic. Okay? And those of us, I know I've got some friends in the Intel booth upstairs, and those of us who are in the technology business, Arthur C. Clarke said, you know, any, you know, uh, technology significantly advanced is indistinguished from magic. And so often we're trying to promote ideas or, or get people to think about things, and it, the only way to get there is with story. 
Simon Sinek, one of my favorites, he says, people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. And, and he has this golden circle of how we do things or what we do and then how we do them and why. And all too often, corporations today have forgotten the why. They just talk about what it is we do and how do we do it. And then there is no why. The why part has become financial gain or whatever, when in reality, the why is the most important part. And that's what we need to consider. Now, this next quote comes from someone who I've grown to really love and respect. It's somebody that I met here last year who impressed me tremendously. And anyone who went to a session yesterday will know this, and you'll get more of him later today. But the, you know, Jason, last year on stage at Story, made this statement. The adult brain makes conclusions and then goes looking for evidence. And I think that relates to what some of us have heard. We make decisions with our heart, and then we justify them with our mind. Jason, if I'm wrong with that, you can correct me, which I adore your correction, so I look forward to being corrected after this. But I think that's kind of what he was saying, okay? The point is that we need both of these, both of these things answered. And if we want to bring it down, and I'm, and I'm sorry to do this, but if we bring it down to truly business-related stuff, we use someone like uh, Jeffrey Gittimer. I don't know if any of you are familiar with this guy, but he's a writer about sales. He's a hard seller. Um, you know, pull on the heart and the wallet will pop out. Story grabs the heart. And by the way, if you don't believe that, how many in the room have currently or have had small children, right? Small children? How many deals do they close? <laughs> I mean, it's like they, they close all of them because they, because they know where the heart is. Now, my, I'm, I'm fortunate enough to have my daughter and my son-in-law here with me, and this is their son, Liam. Now, he's seven years old, but this was a few years ago. But Liam did not come to me and say, Grandfather... I feel the need to become stronger and more coordinated, and I need eye-hand coordination and strength and agility, and I need to do this in a fresh air setting. I'd like for you to build me a play yard, right? <laughs> he didn't do that, right? He just, you know, the little kid just walks up to you, oh, Papa, can I have a playground? And next thing you know, his father Justin and I are just <laughs> banging at things and, and building him a play set because he knows where the heart is, right? And that's what we do at Story, is we know where the heart is, and we can use it for amazing things, right? Um, but it, it's, it's, things change over time. Let me give you an example. Sorry, back up. This represents a company. I was with a company called Green Pasture Software. We were a small company, agile. Everybody was just, you know, doing their own thing. And it was fun, but we became partners with IBM, and IBM eventually bought us. To scale... The right-hand side is IBM, okay? You see the left-hand side, I don't know if anybody can see it, but it's like a little white circle. That's not Green Pasture Software. Green Pasture Software is actually a pixel in the middle of that circle that you can't even see, right? We were overtaken by this huge, gigantic corporation, and when I was introduced to that, I thought, okay, so I'm in this big company, and there's a lot of history, there's a lot of procedure, there's a lot of policies, there's a lot of successes that we don't undo. There's these things that are going on. And my first impression as a creative was the way you're doing things is wrong, and I can do it better. You know, you're not really touching the heart, or you're not messaging it correctly, or whatever. And so I struck out on a personal journey as a creative to make things different. And so I started creating my own materials. I started creating my own uh, slides. And I, I, you know, didn't even look at what marketing was giving because I thought that was like, that's crap. We'll just do my own thing. And I was actually kind of a rogue, and it was so somewhat successful. But I began hearing murmurs of things like, well, you know, I can't do that presentation. That's a Lewis presentation, which was sad because I wasn't mentoring people. And I also heard people say, well, in fact, my managers became looking at me and going, you know, I, you seem to be popular, but I have no idea what you do. And that's a bad place for us to be as a creative. And at that time, I came across a book. And the book is called Orbiting the Giant Hairball. It's by the late Gordon McKenzie. I don't know if any of you have ever, I, by the way, I don't get any proceeds for selling this book. I bought dozens of copies and given them away. But Gordon McKenzie, the, the subtitle is A Corporate Fool's Guide to Surviving with Grace. And it's about us as creative and how we actually live in a corporate environment, how we find balance. His analogy is such that corporations are a bit of a hairball. Every policy, every procedure, every rule, every past success, everything that we hang on to is like a hair, and it joins with another hair. And the larger the corporation, the larger the organization. And by the way, you can be in a small organization that is a giant hairball, okay? So not necessarily by size. But the idea is these little things just start attracting, and all of a sudden you get mass. And in his analogy, which I love because I'm a kind of a visual analogy person, he, this mass becomes get gravity, and gravity starts pulling other things in, and people get sucked into this, right? And here I was as a person at IBM, and I was off. I found my escape velocity. I'm out of here. Okay, I can get out of here. And I was out in this nothing, what he calls the nothingness of space, 
but I was being unimpactful. I wasn't being the person that I was needed to, that I needed to be. And the way Gordon puts it is there's a way for us as creatives inside of organizations like this to find this orbit, okay, to be around it. It's like be of the hairball but not in the hairball kind of thing, right? <laughs> you get that, right? He describes it, and by the way, the book is, you only get a hard copy, I think, right now, and you need it because it's just filled with great illustrations and so forth. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a, the un unthinkable. I'm going to read to you, okay? But I'm going to read a page. I want you to read with me this page from Gordon's book because he describes this process better than I could stand here and describe it. Orbiting's I love responsible creativity. I think that's incredible. Vigorously exploring and operating beyond the hairball of the corporate mindset, beyond accepted models, patterns, or standards, all the while remaining connected to the spirit of the corporate mission. To find orbit around a corporate hairball is to find a place of balance where you benefit from the physical, intellectual, and philosophical resources of the organization without, <laughs> without becoming entombed in the bureaucracy of the institution. His words are just... They, they, they meet me. I don't know how they get to you, but they, I feel them. If you're interested, and I love this, and it's not for everyone, you can achieve orbit by finding the personal courage to be genuine and to take the best course of action to get the job done rather than following the pallid path of corporate appropriateness. <laughs> I know this team. I don't have to say that, you know, that we're, we can get out of bounds in this group because you guys are all over out of bounds. But that's something that people really have to, you have to struggle past, right? And last, to be... To be op optimum value of the corporation endeavor, you must invest enough individuality to counteract the pull of the corporate gravity, but not so much that you escape that pull altogether, just enough to stay out of the hairball. Through the measured assertion of your own uniqueness, it's possible to establish a dynamic relationship with the hairball, to orbit around the institutional mass, and if you do this, you'll make an asset of the gravity, that it becomes a force that keeps you from flying out to the overwhelming nothingness of space. That's where I was. And by the way, when you're there, you're at risk. Because when you're not meaningful, when you're not having, a, a, having an impact, when you're not following along, this isn't about selling out to the corporation. This is about aligning yourself and aligning your creativity and aligning your talents in such a way that you can, that you can have impact on them, but they can also have impact on you. It, it's, it's a dangerous place to be, okay? And then lastly, sorry. Lastly is, if you allow that same gravity to suck you into the bureaucratic hairball, you will find yourself in a different kind of nothingness, the nothingness of a normalcy made stagnant by a compulsion to cling to past successes. How many of you are right now picturing people in your organization, right? How many of us might be picturing ourselves, right? Okay, this is the nothingness of the hairball. We at Story, we storytellers, we have a responsibility we have the responsibility to be that curiosity, to, to, be, to look at these hairballs and say, okay, these are hairballs, and these, the, the idea of complacency just scares us to death. That fear of being caught into nothingness, that fear of saying, I have amazing things that I want to do today, but I won't be able to do them because I have to be appropriate or I have to be the same, or I have to follow corporate, you know, these certain standards. Now, granted, corporate, corporations have standards for a reason, but there's no reason why you can't continually hold your hand up and go, and why again? Can you please explain to me why again we do this? And can, can you show me how this works better than this? I ask you to be the, be the change agents, be the challengers, okay? Those of you who don't have a title as storyteller, you may have another title or something, but, but make yourself known as someone who is someone who challenges things. It's okay to be the challenger model, and I appreciate you to do that. So I, challenge, be curious, keep questioning, but be brave. Find that place and find that place of orbit where both you will benefit from this and your corporation and the other people will benefit from, from well. And it's a beautiful place to be, by the way. Uh, I was not in orbit Two years ago, I'm in orbit now, and I'm loving every minute of it. So, again, enjoy the conference, and see you later. Thanks very much.